to the metal voice back on the show. Oh yeah. Steven Piercy. Rat. What's going on, Steven? How are you doing? Good, 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 good. Uh, great news. BNG in partnership with Rhino Entertainment announces the Atlantic Years limited edition box set celebrating Rat's massively successful period. The five studio albums that were gold, platinum, multi-platinum. Uh, and I guess first question is, okay, what are people going to get with this box set that they haven't gotten in the past? What kind of goodies are we looking at? Well, first, we've never really put out a box set. You know, ironically enough, it's the 40th year anniversary of the band mm -hmm. EP. So realistically, next year will be the 40th year. But it's the 40th year, and I think it's great that it came out, you know, on the 40th. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what would you say that are, are, I know there's, I'm looking at, so this is first time on vinyl, right? These as a box set on vinyl. As a, yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. Nobody Rides for Free, which was on Point Break with Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze. Yeah. Right? That mm -hmm. song is now available on this box set as well, right? Yeah, it's its own 12 inch single. And, and, and the, the um, the box has a, it has all kinds of groovy shit in there. It's got like a poster, a great poster. It's got a pass, pick, uh, um, uh, a booklet, tour book. It's got all kinds of stuff in there. So we kind of threw in everything but the kitchen sink, you know. And it's remastered as well, I'm assuming, right? Remastered as well. And everybody in the band, I say it's it's funny. It's unfortunate we, there is no rat reunion or possibly never will be. But you, you got to get that out of the way right away. <laughs> you got to get that right out of the way. Yeah, because our drummer's out there doing some things and I think too helping out with this. And uh, uh, he's saying that, you know, he's putting the word out. There's hope. I hate giving hope because I've, I've been a solo artist for so long. And then I, I just decided, look, if I can't bring the guys together, which I've tried, I'm not going to beat a dead rat <laughs> per se and, and push the topic. So I pretty much say the only reunion you're getting is everybody was involved with this box set in some way or another, whether giving them personal photos and, and and that's way cool. I, I took Robin's, you know, I I took Robin's uh, gig and and gave what I thought he would like in there, you know. So you talked to Demartini and you talked to everybody. Had a little bit of input into this, right? A little bit, yeah. I didn't talk to him. I haven't talked to you know uh, uh, Warren in ages, and 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 that's unfortunate too. Um, uh, but you know. Uh, I talk to Bobby occasionally, and then there's, yeah. you know, no more discussions left, but to each his own. And it's been a great ride. And, and maybe the band was only supposed to be available and out there for that term, those five records. That's why it's, I, I think it's really important to this box set is that it's, it's the real true rat. There's, you know, because we made other records and we came close, but we'll never, it'll never get to where it should have been. Without the station here. There you go. This guy well, right here. Well, there you go right there. You know, it, it, it's cool. We can bring in other guitarists all day long and other, you know, anybody in the band, but without me, I, I think it's futile. Um, but it just didn't, you know, we can do it and, and suffice and appease and, and, but it doesn't work. And it didn't work. Even Warren and I, when we were making one of those records, I think it was the yellow one. Um, <laughs> uh, um, we said, well, we came close, but no cigar, you know? Uh, so, we kind of all know, you know, we can do this all day long. You know, look, my solo band's out there just kicking ass and, and, and it's me singing and the songs we wrote, I wrote and away we go. How long I'm going to be doing this? I don't know. So I'm just enjoying doing, doing what I'm doing and, and literally 
just saying here you want to rat and roll i'm around and and this box set that's why the box set to me is 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 important it's it's the five guys the five records the 80s and thank you very much you know um what about the publishing and the masters do you own those now or that's still owned by atlantic or some other group I don't discuss those things. Okay. All right. No, I mean, because you hear you're promoting it. So maybe there is, you know, a, a contract in place, but we won't discuss that. All right. It's fair enough. Fair enough. You yeah. Know, I was just there's, curious. There's obviously uh, benefits to each his own, you know, the writers, et cetera. But, you know, that that's about it. You know, I mean, okay. the, the catalog is, is what it is, you know. What, what about the very, AP? very proud of the legacy you know that's that's what I, all i can say you know and you should be and you should be you know as i was kind of like going through all the albums you guys were on fire man you guys were literally on fire you know album it's, it's a quality in you know each album had its own little sort of distinct uh you know tone to it and they're all quality albums those five are a great legacy man you know um yeah, we had a great, like I say, it was a great ride. You know, I, I, we learned quite a lot, or I learned quite a lot, and have great advice. <laughs> uh, you know, but you know, you live and learn. We had a great time, and and I think, uh, yeah, you know, there, there's really not much to say there, but we did what we did, and we always did our best, and. Hey, that's rat and roll, you know. I mean, we're not the most dysfunctional band on the planet, but pretty, pretty close. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. Why was the EP not sort of put with the box set? Like, I mean, is that what's going to happen with that? The EP. Well, the, good question. Uh, the EP doesn't belong to to those guys over there at Atlantic, and and it belongs to Robin and myself. Uh, soon enough and i'm gonna release it on vinyl limited edition probably the end of the year okay all right good, good. oh i had a yeah. bridge packaging not the atlantic version because we did release ep on atlantic for okay. a moment are, are there going to be any extras on the ep that you're going to include or going all the way back to the original i'm going to the original as it should have been you know uh, and maybe only make a hundred thousand available because at the time, it, what got us the deal besides the band being a great rock band and and you know it got us signed. Um, the EP sold like eighty to a hundred thousand back in eighty three independently on a, on our managers. Wow. Uh, so I might find those realistic numbers, and that's all I'm going to release. You know, make it something special, you know, not just throw it out there, you know. So so I'm hearing talk about the Sunset Strip Experience Tour. Mm -hmm. what, what's what, what does that mean? Like, what's that going to entail? Well, the Sunset Strip Experience uh, was created because, you know, the 80s were such an important part in the music business. You can call it what you want now, hair metal, this. It doesn't bother me because the minute you say hair metal, you're going to the 80s. Um, there were a lot of great bands. And, and I love it that some of these bands now are embracing it instead of trying to shy away from it. Because a lot of bands did. They didn't even want to be associated with the 80s because they were intimidated by the 90s or these bands or whatever. I'm not. I could give a shit. You know, I'm embracing the 80s. So we created this uh, uh, Sunset Strip experience to move forward with or without me. And and the, my point being, it, it, it'll probably end up being its own residency with 80s bands and 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 way much more involved i mean you'll, you'll hear about it soon enough just go to official stephenpiercy.com and then we'll be putting tidbits out it's taken a quite a while to establish so i decided this year next year we're going to put that out there and i'm and i love it that these bands are you know promoters are understanding that it works you know there's and a lot of bands aren't around anymore i mean even kicks is pulling out 
uh, unfortunately. Great band, Atlantic Brothers, Records Brothers. So, you know, as we're all dropping like flies and bands are breaking up and there's like one original member and, it, you know, that shit doesn't work with me. So I decided let's embrace the 1980s and, and let people in on the, the experience, the whole the whole trip, you know, and have these bands who are still available uh, uh, do these shows that I have upcoming and next year will be pretty much the the beginning of it all and and my point being is there are so many tribute cover bands out there your van halen's your motley's your rats your 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 yeah, leopards your you name it i mean when we're gone those guys are going to be representing the decade of decadence the the that strip experience so we've got a whole plan uh, coming at you for next year and and we're developing it. It's taking time. So while I'm out there as a solo artist, I'm letting people know there's some good stuff coming. And maybe I'll even be presenting uh, without giving too much away the uh, the best Van Halen, Motley, Rat, whatever tribute bands. And they'll be the Sunset Strip experience. You know, you follow me? So in other words, just high, high level without giving too much away, it would be something similar to you go to Vegas and there's a whole, uh, you know, maybe it's like a day of residency, right? Something, and but it would be the sunset experience in Vegas or something like that, right? You've got it. You got it. And it, it's, it, yeah, it just didn't happen overnight. We, it took a couple, it took a while to, to kind of develop and and then we created this company that's a, a literally a metaverse uh, uh interactive uh, uh company in this building that's phenomenal and the company is called the me v-a-m-i-e-e -E. mm -hmm. and we we're putting on uh 1980s sunset strip experiences uh, uh concerts experience concerts next year with whatever bands are available still in the eighties, kicking it out there and I'll be your wonderful host. And maybe I'll get D. I mean, we're talking to a lot of, we're talking to a lot of people to be, to host these, to host the, the concerts, you know, and, and, but that's a whole nother thing. I mean, I love certain parts of the business and one is creating and developing, um, but it, you'll be able to reach, you know, I'll be able to reach 250,000 people all over the world. I'll have a 300 seat capacity uh, um, audience and anything goes. I don't even need to explain it. You go on the site and get it. A lot of people get it. And some people are still going, is that green screen? No, it's not. It's far beyond you know throwing up a green screen it's 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 literally taking one of two hundred fifty thousand people and saying have a seat right here we're gonna chit chat and then you're gonna see it, it's quite amazing actually it's quite amazing right. yeah. um if you don't mind me asking have you inspired people with your struggle when you you sort of got into remission and cancer i mean do people come up to you and say I, I, a lot of artists you know when they they go through that struggle and again, only if you're comfortable talking about it. Like, I don't want to uh, impose. Sure. Well, you know what? It's ironic you bring that up, and I'm glad you did. I just, you know, I, I do my cameos, and one of the best things I love about the, the cameo is I can get personal with our audience who are struggling with, you know, uh, disease or addiction. And, and I'll be straight up because, you know, I've been sober for years and, and, and I'm going through this remission thing. And, and I talked with somebody yesterday who was, he's on his, you know, last leg with colon cancer and he just wanted to chat and it, his buddy wanted me to chat him up and play wanted man. And I did, you know, and, that's what I love about that. So yeah, I love getting you know in touch with with these people who who really need you know attention and and advice and and just even to, to bullshit uh, um, because hey, you only live twice, right? <laughs> <laughs> what can people expect on your set list when they see you live? Okay, you're on the Monsters of Rock cruise recently, right? Oh, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, well, with respect, everything and everything I can throw at you, but there's only so many uh, 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 songs I can play. But the best thing about my solo band is, you know, I can do a cover song. I can play a priest, uh, 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 an Aerosmith, a Zeppelin. I mean, look, I'm out there to have a great time. You know, I don't want to beat you on the head with rap music all day, but I do have to play certain songs, you know, or people get a little uptight. Um, but but it's way cool, you know. I, uh, you can expect a great band. Uh, we sound good. It, it's sounding better and better. And uh, a good time, you know. I'm excited. Okay, let's do this. Let's go quickly through all the albums in the box set and just give me a memory from each one, okay? Sure. All right? And just to tell you, I bought this when it came out, okay? This is not from the box set. This is, look, a little, little Canadian stamp there. You see that? Ah, interesting. Hey, you see that? Well, all right. Some some pros and cons when you were recording this album. Ooh. Okay. Good, good and bad. You know, like, man, I didn't like that part, but I love this part. Well, sure. I don't think there's any cons. The only con I can see on there is we wrote a song called Reach for the Sky. And it was recorded along with the rest of the 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 songs for out of the cellar and it didn't make it and i i just came upon it i actually wanted it in the box set it was written by uh, uh myself robin and joey cristopanelli who was our bass player in early 83 when uh crucier was ping-ponging around didn't know if he wanted to be in docking and and whatever the case may be so anyway we ended up writing uh this great oh no you know what i'll take that back <laughs> it was mark tureen oh mark bullet boys okay he, he it was him who sat in with the band when warren was ping pong and it was really interesting period because everybody was ping ponging around trying to find their place <laughs> In, in, in uh, you know the scene and here robin and i were just trying to establish create this band rat uh so anyway we wrote this great song and that's the con that uh, you just you just froze hold on you're freezing, you're freezing yeah up. he's trying to call me okay uh, it's ridiculous. i just got rid of him all right just get rid if, of them. go ahead okay the pros and cons of Out of the Cellar. Okay, well, it was all pro, number one, because we were just happy to be signed. Uh, and, you know, as Robin would say, hey, if it's good enough for Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin Atlantic Records, it's good enough for Rat. All we wanted to do was go go plastic. <laughs> we did, you know, platinum and gold and all of this was, okay, you got to work for that. But we just wanted a record out. And then we were introduced to the staff producer who was new and Bo Hill. And the pros about that, besides Bo and Rat, the guys actually creating what we created for many years. And that was a pro going into the studio. I mean, everything about it was great. There was nothing bad about it. We busted our ass. We we gave them everything we had. Uh, the con is that there was a song called "Reach for the Sky" that was written and uh, recorded at with all the other songs round and round, etc. That didn't make it, and I actually wanted it on the box set, this box set, but it didn't go down. So. I'm going to make sure it gets released soon enough. Um, but it was written by uh, myself, Robin, and uh, if I'm correct, uh, Mark Tureen, who was a guitar player pretty much in early 83. And he sat in with the band Rat and played shows, Roxy, Troubadour, uh, et cetera. When Warren didn't, you know, we had already brought Warren in. But everybody was trying to grab him, docking, and everybody was just flip flopping, ping ponging uh, back then, trying to find their their place. But that song has to come out, and you know, I ended up using the title for a record later, and we'll get to that. 
Was there any was there any mysterious player like you said, Mark, that was sort of part of that first album that didn't get credit or should have gotten credit? Or <laughs> yeah, there were some little legalities going on there with Robin and his his old band, uh, uh, a couple of his guitar player uh, or his guitar player that didn't get credit through a typo or something. We got a little grief for that had to deal with that legally but hey whatever shit happened. you know those first albums that's how it's like right all right then we go to album number two right invasion oh. of privacy oh okay well invasion that's where we really found our footing and we did we worked hard on that record i, I believe we had a studio a portable studio took a break in japan if I'm, if I'm correct, that record, but I mean, Warren coming up with, you know, lay it down and, and uh, those songs are just incredible. Bo actually got his footing, you know, and we, we had literally Bo and myself learned how to create this. He calls it the steasel voice, you know, because there was a certain way I record and I still use his schematics to this day on anything I record. It's just the way it is. It just became a natural thing. And we, we kicked ass with that record. I mean, it, it got, a, we thought it was a little too polished, you know, but we were very happy with the outcome. And to this day, well, those songs are the best songs in the set. Or well, my, uh, I, I, I remember, you know, being a teenager and I was in Florida with vacation with my parents at the time. And when Lay It Down came on the radio, man, it just like burst out of the speakers. That yeah, riff, that opening riff is just. That opening riff, just ass kicking. <laughs> and then when you come in, it's just perfectly done. That's all I'm saying, you know. Thank it's, it's, you. Yeah. yeah, I love that record. You know, I, I, uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, I don't believe there were any leftovers from out of the cellar that, that made that record at all. I'd have to have it, would have to have it in front of me to, to really get into it. But, and what I like about you guys, it's always a co write, you know, most of the times, you know, there's everybody's con contributing. And I think that is what you started off with. It was five guys with those five albums. That was Rat, and and I think that was the beauty of Rat. Yeah, and and you know we we we, I mean I regret and have advice <laughs> always when it comes to writing and co-writers and publishing and this and that these days because you learn. Hey, should you really get credit for uh, going bump 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 bump? That, that doesn't constitutes uh any real credit as a writer so we decided hey all for one all you know all for one one for all for the four main guys who wrote except for bobby and that was a big mistake but you know what hey you know shit happens you know all right here we go rocking and rolling there we go that's the next one dancing on the cover yeah, dancing. Wow, um, dancing. That record, and I think people get it. W you know, we consciously, Robin and myself, and I believe Warren, really wanted to get back to in between uh, uh, the EP and Cellar because we thought Invasion got a little too polished. So we wanted that record to be a little rougher. And I think it we did our job. You know, it's a great record. There's some good it's songs. A great record. Yeah, yeah. You Were know. there the suits, the suits of Atlantic Records saying, look at guys, these are your chart numbers. We need a hit here. We need a hit there. Uh it's it's quarter end. We need another hit. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> were they were smart enough to not bother us with that. I mean, because they had we had working our asses off out there on the road 250 plus shows you know a year if not more um 
But no, they knew better than to bother us with that and let us do what we did. We wrote our own hits. And we'll get to that later when we get to albums. But uh, oh, Dan yeah. is is a good record. We wanted it to be rougher. And I think we... Hey, you even got into... The Body Talk got into Eddie Murphy's The Golden Child. You had sure. Miami Vice episode with Dance. You know, there you go. What else can you ask for, right? Yeah. Weird Science, I believe, right? One song made it in there too from dance, uh, dancing. Uh, no, that was wanted. Yeah, uh, then you you opened up for. I'm not sure if you were support, but Poison Tour, Cinderella Tour, Cheap Trick Tour, Queensrÿche Tour, and Vinnie Vincent Invasion Tour. So that's pretty. That's pretty yeah. stellar. Well, I'll tell you, there's one thing that Rat did. We picked great opening acts. We didn't give a shit how good they were, how colorful, and, and it just didn't, we didn't care. We, from day one, we decided we have no competition. I mean, look, we were running around with Motley so early on in the scene, and, and I appreciate when people recognize that, you know, the Wasp, Motley, Rat, uh, uh, these early 80s, 80s bands were the real guys from the sunset strip because as the genre got popular you know you started getting into the cookie cookie cutter bands right you had the mini motley's many rats many leopards many and so you know what i mean uh so be it so it's nice to to for people to go oh yeah those are the real guys from from the who started that scene, you know, I blame I blame it all on Van Halen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, we get to that too. But the Gladiators, okay. Explain to people what were the Gladiators? Who were the Gladiators? Uh -huh. Oh, I have a great story about that. Uh, the Gladiators were, you know, Robin and I knew we had to hit the strip. We you had to be seen, you know, and, and we went out and we uh, uh, stumbled upon Motley guys, right? And I don't know if we went and saw them at a show in like 82 or something, eight, early 83. No, it had to have been 82, I believe. And we became friends and like really tight. So we would all go out together. It would be Nikki, Vince, Tommy, Robin, myself, and we would hit the strip and just fuck it up, you know, and we decided to call ourselves the Gladiators, and Robin was great at nicknames, so he gave everybody a nickname, like, I, I don't know if uh, Nikki uh, gave Robin the, the king, king um, well, he did himself, but anyway, it fit him perfectly. But anyway, Robin you know, named everybody. Vince was Phil Marshall. I was Rat Leader, a uh, uh, Rat Patrol Leader. Nikki was Nikki Leader Six. You know, I mean, Tommy was. Uh, he had some weird stallion, weird... huh? Stallion. <laughs> no. <laughs> He had some weird name, like uh, like a field marshal kind of a trip name. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was just a fun kind of tag. And it came from, now I dig this, and I actually have the original ticket, is I was booking, I was our agent and everything back in the early days when I moved the band Mickey Rat up to LA in 1980 because Ed Van Halen's advice to me, go to move, move to LA. So anyway, we had this show at the Troubadour, and we've been playing there a couple times. And Doug Weston, the owner, he uh, told me one time, he goes, I don't like the name Rad anymore. I, I want you to, you guys can't play here anymore unless you change your name. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm going to change it. And we've already played here. We, we, we you know, shitloads of people come in. You're only paying us a hundred fucking dollars anyway, right? So he made me change the name. So I went, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to call the uh, the band the Gladiators. And I, I I really wish I had it in front of me because I could actually show it to you. I'll put it up on the site later just because of this. But um, it, it, he made me change the name of Rat to the Gladiators. I mean, literally on the ticket, Gladiators. And so I found it. I had a rat stamp made, R-A-T-T. -T. So when I got the tickets that you had to sell, I'd, we'd stamp everyone with rats so people would know it was rats. 
But as far as he was concerned, it was gladiators. So what happens? Anyway, people are like, rat, rat. We sell out two shows one day in the fucking rain. And Doug decides, oh, okay, I guess you can call yourselves rats. You know, the minute you started doing well at the Troubadour, as Motley did and everybody else, uh, GNR, you name it, even years later, you move up the strip. You go to uh, the Roxy and then the Whiskey. And then move on down the street to the Palladium and on and on and on. But anyway, that's the story of the gladiators right there. All right. No, because I saw a tweet about it. And I think it was in reference to Mick Mars. And then, but we were like in the gladiators right before. And they were trying to, and I don't want to get into all that, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. But. sure. I mean, look, we were, we, we hung out. I mean, look, there weren't too many people. I mean, Blackie would hang out. I mean, I don't know if he was an official member of the gladiators, but it, Chris Hall, uh, Chris, uh, who I ran into on, on the cruise. I mean, I love these guys. We go so far back because we all started at the same time. Was Chris a gladiator, Chris Holmes? I don't think so. But Blackie, we would all end up hanging out together. You know, the Mo Motley guys, Rack guy, or pretty much just Robin and me um, my, and myself and a couple of guys from Wasp. And we just caused havoc, man, you know. Good we, times, man. Good times. <laughs> yeah, we always end up somebody's place, uh, whether it be uh, uh, the guy from Hustler Magazine's house or somebody's, and, and uh, milk it until five in the morning or whatever. And hey, that was our daily routine to be Can seen, it? to be seen, to be heard. And get those flyers on those poles, you know. Them's was the days, huh? Yeah. <laughs> reach for the sky. Do I have reach for the sky? Do I have reach for the sky here. Oh, reach um, sky. Oh, okay. Here's where we got where I think the band started maturing a little bit, especially Warren as a guitarist. Warren was his playing escalated so fast from day one. And he would come up with these riffs, like uh, I believe Way Cool uh, is on there, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and stuff like that. And we just, we really changed course with that record. I mean, it wasn't just bam, bam, you know, heavy metal, heavy metal. We didn't want to be that anyway. We didn't want to be your leather studs band in the first place. Yep. So. It, 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 that record was kind of experimental, but not really. Um, we gave you all we had, you know. I mean, that's one thing I have to say about the band and, and the guys as writers, co-writers, whatever the case may be, because some songs we wrote individually and, and collectively. But I, I think that's where everybody hit a pinnacle and started stretching, you know, because... Here you got one guy loves the Beatles and Eagles, and then you got Robin and I who are total metalheads, you know, and then the loving Zeppelin, Aerosmith, and et cetera, Blue Oyster Cult. And uh, we really kind of developed a bit as songwriters uh, on Reach. And, and here's where uh, the song Reach for the Sky mm -hmm. title came that ended up being the title for that album but i gotta tell you every one of our records was a song title that i either wrote or that was written there's a song out of the cellar invasion of your privacy ended up being body talk reach for the sky well there's reach for the sky dancing undercover was actually a song and even detonator you know yeah yeah uh bobby Bobby wrote, co wrote, I think on the last album, he has what, one or two writing? Bobby Blotzer on Drive Me Crazy. Yeah, a song I wrote. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we just threw him a bone or whatever, but. Uh, Was he much of a songwriter in general? Yeah. Like, or, or some people are, some people aren't, right? I mean. No, no. From day one, no. I mean, aspirations, yeah. I mean, you know, he has great ideas. I mean, great drummer. Um, but he wasn't like a, 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 a real writer, writer guy during the early periods. And he knew it. It wasn't until way later when he had the opportunity with these other guitarists and other guys in Rat mm -hmm. that he was able to, you know, 
get away with putting his songs on there. All right. Um, before we get to the last album, which is Detonator, um, tell me about the Van Halen. You told me, you know, Eddie Van Halen. I know there's a connection. You met the guys yeah. back in yeah. the day. Quick yeah, story I met on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, as the story goes in my book, uh, kept great book, by the way. I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. What I really started getting into, because I really wanted to be a guitar player. You know, I became a singer because nobody could sing the songs I wrote. And I mean, that whole EP is Mickey Rat songs, except for You Think You're Tough, which Robin and I wrote in 82, I believe. Um, but um, uh, where are we going here? We are. Danny Allen, are we, you got another interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing a lot of these. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, a friend of mine, I'm just a guitar player, right? And around 1978, early 78, maybe late 77, a friend of mine in LA, because I had moved to San Diego, kept going, you got to see this band, this guitar player. They're crazy. They're insane. They're like Zeppelin. They're like whatever. And I kept blowing them off, right? I, I'm driving there like... So anyway, he eventually he goes, they're playing at Gazzari's. And there's an ironic story there, too. They're playing Gazzari's. Gazzari's, you got to see them. I never made it up to see them. So here I'm developing as a guitar player, buying all this great gear, early Vox 30 heads and blah, blah. And so he calls me again and goes, you better see this band. They now they're playing the whiskey, right? The the place to play and on up. So I go, fuck it. I'm gonna go see them. Mm -hmm. I get a pocket full of joints. I drive myself up to the whiskey. And I know bands do sound checks. I know where the backstage was. I drove myself up there and I parked. And I said, I'm gonna wait till I see one of those fucking guys, right? And I did. I saw Dave Lee Woodrock walking up the steps. I go, hey, Dave, you want to smoke a joint? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I'm fucking in, right? Now I can meet Ed, this guy, this little crazy guitar player guy I've been hearing about. And sure enough, we smoke a joint. I'm like, thanks, Dave. You know, and I go right to Ed's dressing room. Where is that guy? Well, lo and behold, we're into the same shit. He's looking for gear that I had. Uh, vintage gear and he ended up buying my old box 30 and, and etc guitars we traded and then uh but anyway i was able to see him meet him and we became friends and i'd go see him all the time when they play i mean he'd let they let me sit on the stage you know cross leg i just watch him and take notes and go and fuck this is this band is insane nobody knows about this in san diego nobody knows about this around the country only in hollywood right so their first record's coming out anyway ed's like why you gotta move to la man you know this is where the shit's happening so I decided after seeing them become this monstrous group in 78, 79, and then come January 1, 1980, I go, I'm moving to LA. Literally January 1st, 1980. You guys come in, let's go. And that was how uh, it all your began. story began. That's how your story uh, began. <laughs> all right, last one. Last yeah, one. Mickey Rat. There you go. Oh, okay, detonator. Yeah, all right. Ah, here's where so here you're, now you're bringing in, you know, is this when you're bringing Desmond Child, right? Yeah. Desmond. Is that a mistake or not? There were pros and cons to that record. Um, because, I mean, Reach for the Sky, actually, we had a different producer. Yes. That recorded first. So let's take a step back. Mike Stone, we thought uh zeppelin whoever uh guys huge we want to just change things up a bit it wasn't that i didn't despise bo hill i loved our our communication uh his producing i still chat with him to this day and we have done stuff through the years and i have nothing bad about to say about him because i know bob's out there kind of dissing a little well that's his trick so anyway uh, Mike Stone pulls in. Well, it turns to shit. 
but he, he does the recording. So Bo comes back in and says, uh, he pretty much was a very important part of that rat yep. sound and that, you know, the way we wrote, because Bo is the only guy who knew how to get the best out of me. He would make me do shit over and over and over. Maybe even word by word, but not not to an extreme. Um, but he worked us, and he and he got the job. So anyway, detonator. So now it gets interesting because now some of the guys are like, "No, nope, we don't want to go with there with Bo." So here we are. We're put in this position. Okay. Well, I don't know how it was brought up to us. Uh, well, Des, we're going to co-write some songs with Desmond. Okay. We're into it. I'm into it. I love co-writing with people. Um, <clears throat> so here we are, Sir Arthur Payson, this new producer guy. And we're like, oh, shit, this is going to get interesting, right? And it did get interesting. I'm surprised uh, we got the best out of us that we could, you know, because it was a weird time for the band. Uh, there was a lot going on internally, externally, business, and the business seeped into the personal. Uh, there was a lot of complications that aren't unfamiliar with success, <laughs> success and excess, if you know what I mean. That's why it's called Decade of Decadence. Uh, so Detonator was a tough one. It really was. Still we, produced some great songs, and it's still a great album, and it holds holds up well. Yeah, it holds up well. I can agree there. It holds up well. We did record some great songs. We wrote a few great songs on there. I mean, look, I had to, we had to dig into the archives, like Top Secret. That was a Mickey Rat song I wrote in fucking 19. 79 or something you know uh so i don't think we were all really everybody was a little however you want to take that and i i, th I, th I think i'm burning out your voice <laughs> explain are you, are you okay but, so we got the best out of it that we could detonate and i liked it the best thing about it and it's too bad that that uh, the song Giving Yourself Away that I wrote mm -hmm. with Diane Warren and Desmond wasn't a single because for years when it was popular to do a ballad, because we hated doing ballads, we gave you a couple, Robin and I, uh, during the years, but not the real sappy, the ones that got you uh, uh, on TVs, more play. We just weren't into what everybody was doing. That's what what, differentiated, what what separated Rat from a lot of these 80s bands. We just didn't follow along with, uh, oh, you got to do what they do. You got to do what they do because they did it and it's huge and whatever. We're like, I don't give a shit. You know, we just want to be a great rock band, play great music, put on great shows. And I'm old school, 70s. So that's where my trip was at. I, I, I didn't follow trends. We never did. Uh, but we wrote our, that record proved that Rat wrote our own hits collectively as a band, you know, the four of us. Um, but anyway, my only uh, con on that record is that Giving Yourself Away, which is a brilliant song, it didn't get the attention that it should have because everybody has moved was moved on with, a, oh, you got to have a ballad. And then here we go. Well, we're going to give you one now uh japan caught on to it they made their own video they did their own trip the label over there uh but the record's good then again we wanted to get a little more aggressive you know we always try to get back to the roots and it was difficult to do you know uh as you say the label wanted this the label wanted that and we weren't the guys to, to, to be told what to do it just wasn't going to happen yeah. You know. All right. Here, here's my final question to you. Um, sure. Robin Crosby, yeah. his legacy in Rat. I mean, yeah. if you were to sort of give a couple sentences on his legacy in Rat and on these albums, what was it? Oh. Dang. <laughs> Dang. He was, uh, uh, he lived and breathed Rat. 
And if he was around today, he would be kicking some ass because of how some of the guys, and I'll be straight up, have just dislocated themselves from this great brand band entity. You know, like, yeah, I don't give a shit. It is what it is. Well, it happens. You know, you, you get some musicians who, you know, I'm over it. You know what I'm saying? That's okay if you're over it, but at least step up and be proud of of your legacy. And Robin was the epitome of rat and roll. I mean, he was the he was our leader. You know, he was our he was our guy. He was the one who kept the shit together. So when he started falling apart, we fell apart at the seams. You know, there was not much I could do. I mean, it was mutiny after he was gone. It was mutiny for on me, you know, <laughs> uh, because I was the only one left doing everything, you know. You know, when I was reading your book, I read it a long time ago, but I remember that sort of his downfall. I was, yeah. I, that must have been rough to live through something like that, watching your friend disintegrate or the band leader disintegrate. Yeah. I, you know, I had friends that have, that have happened to, right? So. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, that's the excess with success. And, and, you know, it, it, it's a, it, it's a bad thing. Um, but you learn from it. I mean, look, it almost took me down, especially when he he pulled out. When he was out, not even after he passed. I mean, oh, that was just terrible. It affected me because he was my right-hand man from day one. I mean, we he picked Warren to come into the band. Uh, him and I did a lot of legwork. You know, I mean, when we bounced around as the gladiators, we were doing that for a reason to be fucking noticed here we are you know and he could not be missed you know he was king and i was just rap patrol leader but without him as my right hand man at 100 percent uh you know the music took a uh, uh it wasn't the first thing on, on it wasn't the first thing that we were into you know it was it was other things you know but um, yeah I, and the only thing I can say about Robin is, is, is he was the glue that kept us together. And he was the king, man. He was, he was like, I, all I can say about it, he, he lived and breathed the band. And, and I knew when he was out, it was pretty much the end of what we were, what we had accomplished. I knew it, you know. On a positive note, the Atlantic uh, years is coming out, right? The box set, it's going to be available June 9th. It's limited. Right. So do your pre-orders now. Right. Pick you them up. Yeah. You can pre-order a lot of places, but pre-order it at uh, official Stephen com because there's some other way cool stuff. I make it available collectibles and stuff. Um, and I do these way cool auctions and I have such an archive of material, be it video, music, songs, never heard. And you'll hear them uh, eventually, uh, but like great, old merch, this, that, that I love our fans, which I call friends. I love them to have, you know, so go to my site. There's web cool stuff there. I have plenty of shows coming up. It, we, we have established the, uh, 80 sunset strip experience and we are literally taking that to the next level. And Hey, it's rat and roll and it's in this box set and it's fucking badass. Everybody in the band had, uh, uh, something to do with it. So there's your reunion, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, it's a pleasure talking to you. We'll do it again. And I wish you all the success. And I love seeing how productive you are. I just, you're just keep cranking Thank them out and keep going. Be proud of yourself. All right. I appreciate it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Talk soon, man. Thanks. Thank you, brother.